Well, uh, before we get to the questions, go ahead, let's go ahead and uh, start off by saying my name is Spencer Jones. Um, I graduated from Scappoos High School in 2007. Uh, immediately, the very next month upon graduating, I joined the United States Marine Corps. Uh, I served seven years. Uh, fortunately for me, I was medically uh, retired under honorable conditions due to injuries sustained in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, I loved all seven years I served in the Marine Corps. I went in as the infantry, uh, frontline infantry in the United States Marine Corps. My first unit was 1st uh, one four Bravo, otherwise known as 1st Marines, 4th uh, Marine Division. I was attached to Bravo Company uh, for about three and a half years before I re-enlisted and uh, went to 29 Palms, California, where I uh, spent the remainder of my time with 1st Battalion, 7th Marines Animal Company. Um, with 1st Battalion, 4th Marines, uh, I did two tours. I'll get into that. I'm pretty sure with the questions. And uh, with 1-7, I uh, served on one tour uh, to Afghanistan, where uh, eventually I was transferred to Wounded Warrior Battalion for my recovery. And uh, upon that, exited the Marine Corps and continued on with life, as, as we all call it. So um, with that, let's go ahead and fire out the questions. Uh, the first is the, a basic question. Uh, where did you enlist? What's that? Uh, where did you enlist? Um, okay, before I get to that question, also just letting you know, I'm, harsh, I'm almost literally deaf in my left ear. Okay. Uh, so, it, I don't consider it yelling. It may be yelling to you, but it is not yelling to me. So go ahead and make sure you okay. talk really loud. <laughs> um, where did I enlist? Oh. Well, there's a MEP station in Portland. Um, don't ask me what MEPs means because I was too excited as a teenager to care. Um, that's where I rose my right hand and swore an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies foreign and domestic. Um, it was on uh, July 8th uh, is when I did it. July 8th, 2007. Um, stayed overnight. July 9th, 2007, I was in uh, MCRD San Diego, Marine, Marine Corps Recruiting Department, San Diego. And uh, from there, I stepped on the yellow footprints. If you guys ever seen a Marine video, you'll know what the yellow footprints are. Uh, I was there, oh my goodness, 15 years ago. I'm really not that old, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. All right. So, where were you living at this time? Oh. Well, uh, I kind of had a little bit of a rough childhood, I guess you could say. Um, I, I guess we're all high schoolers, so you're really not children anymore. Um, during my high school time, I kind of bounced around from house to house, um, had a bit of a broken family. Um, so I kind of was off and on at home. Um, other than that, I lived in the streets for a little bit um, and then lived with a couple friends. The day I went and signed up, uh, I was actually at my mother's place for the first time in two years, and uh, she was able to see me off. So uh, essentially, I was still living in Scappoos. Gotcha. Okay. Next question is, uh, why did you join? Ooh. You know, I get this a lot, and I'll tell you right now, <laughs> there's a different answer every time. Uh, there's a lots of reasons I've joined, actually. Um, one being that I kind of had respect for all those that came before me. Um, I had the honor and the privilege of meeting several Vietnam veterans, World War II veterans. Uh, I actually work with a couple of them in uh, some of these organizations I'm affiliated with. Um, and our country was at war. I'm sure you all remember, two, well, you don't remember it. You do remember hearing about it. 2001, the Twin Towers were attacked. Uh, I watched it. Uh, I was in middle school at the time. Uh, I watched it on the news, and we were all sent home. The whole country was on complete lockdown. Um, I mean, I'm, some of the older room <laughs> remember. Uh, schools were vacated, bases were fully loaded with armed Marines, Army, Navy. Um, and I'll be honest, when I saw the towers attacked, uh, I was angry. I was very, very angry that someone would come over and, and kill over 3,000 innocent people for, for no reason. Um, I don't like bullies. As a matter of fact, I, I actively seek out bullies. That's my favorite thing to do. Uh, so the Marine Corps was the right place to go for me because the Marine Corps actively seeks out boys like that and uh, we take care of them. 
Um, why did you pick the service branch you joined? Oh, the list is shorter to tell you why I didn't. Um, ever since I was eight, uh, I wanted to be a Marine. Um, there are movies out there. Uh, one of them was Full Metal Jacket. Saw it when I was very young. I thought that's what I want to be. Um, it was kind of like 70% up until the, the, the towers on 9-11, and then it was 100%. And uh, after that, you know, hearing the stories I did about Marines that came before me, um, some of which I knew who served in the places I served in later today, uh, later to date, uh, for me, the Marine Corps was the place to go. Um, I was always told the Marines do the hardest work with the crappiest gear. Uh, we get the hand-me-downs from the Army. Now, don't get me wrong, the Navy SEALs are great, served with those guys, trained with those guys. They are phenomenal, especially when they got all that cool gear. I, unfortunately, didn't have that cool gear. Um, we, <laughs> most of the time, our guns jammed. Most of the time, our MBGs, <laughs> night vision goggles didn't work, um, especially when you needed them to, uh, especially in firefights, and they go out, you, you see nothing but flashes. Those guys have everything you can think of, but they're still great guys to serve with. For me, the Marine Corps was just appealing, and uh, they also have the best dress service off of the uniforms. Today, very shiny. Yeah. So, um, what do you recall from your first days in service? Now, are we talking about boot camp, or are we talking um, about recruit training in that aspect, or? Are you just talking about like maybe my first? Either, either or for both if you want. All right, here, let's see. I'll, I'll kind of walk you through the. So there's three main parts when you get into the service. You got recruit training for the Marine Corps. Uh, all right, that's uh, longer than any other branch service, three months. Three month boot camp, every other branch service is usually two. Um, and then you've got uh, SOI or MCT, so Marine Corps training or School of Infantry training. Those that are in combat rules typically go to School of Infantry. Those that are not in combat rules, you got your radio operators, intel, intelligence officers, all that kind of stuff, they go to Marine Corps training. The difference between those two is SOI is an additional two months of training, MCT is uh, only three weeks, uh, at least when I went. And then you go, after you graduate SOI, you go to your, what they call parent unit. It's the unit that will be harboring you until they have use of you. Um, my first thoughts walking into boot camp were, here we go. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't really much to it. Uh, initially, it wasn't what I expected because the first two weeks of boot camp, you're getting shots, you're getting dental work, your teeth checked out, you're having physical done, you're getting your camis your uniforms all measured up and everything, and then uh, you learn a little bit of what's to come in the next coming days. You learn how to march, and I'll tell you right now, a lot of people don't know how to march. Um, you march opposite leg with the opposite arm, so if the left leg you know, goes back, right leg goes, some of these people can't do that, they, they march like this. <laughs> so you learn how to march. <laughs> it's funny, you can totally laugh, it's hilarious to watch, um, and you learn a little bit about what to expect, and then they have what they call intro week. Intro week is where you meet the lovely drone instructors, the, the guys that will be spending the next two and a half months yelling and screaming at you every <laughs> single waking minute of the day. That is not an exaggeration. These guys don't normally talk normal, and when they do, you are very shocked. Um, it was kind of hard in the beginning of boot camp because you're not allowed to use I, me, or my. You're allowed to say this recruit. So in boot camp, the essential understanding for it is, is uh, like my drill instructor said, I see 120 useless individuals, and uh, it's meant to break you down. You know, you're, you're, everyone comes from different playing fields. I met guys that were coming off the street. We actually had a homeless guy in boot camp. Uh, he'd been on the street for years, and uh, he was in boot camp. We had people that had parents who were millionaires. They came in, and you can tell the difference between the two. You have people that have normal lives, others that were raised on farmlands, others that were raised in the water, not essentially mermaids, that's my Navy. <laughs> but like, they have like lived on a sailboat. I lived on a sailboat um, for a good duration of my young youth. 
And the thing is, is in, in the drill instructor's mind, everyone is equally worthless to the Marine Corps. You have no use to the Marine Corps. You are worthless. You are literally, maggots literally have better use in life than you do to the Marine Corps. And it's, there's a reason for that. The reason is, is because everyone needs to be on one level playing field. In the Marine Corps, everyone needs to be on the same page. Uh, there's no room for error because error results in death. And so we don't want that. Um, in the Marine Corps, there's a saying, you're only allowed to die when you're ordered to die. Um, so everyone needs to be on the same playing field. And that's why initially my thoughts were, well, this is like home. <laughs> I get yelled at every day. Um, so for me, it wasn't much of a drastic change once boot camp got up and going. Uh, it is difficult, though. Uh, the first two weeks, we dropped 45 people. Immediately gone in the first two weeks. Um, the next month, what we call the range weeks, when you go to the rifle range, if you don't pass the rifle range, this is an expert batch. Um, I shot this one. This is my boot camp one, actually. Shot expert my first time in uh, boot camp. You have the uh, expert, which is expert shooter, sharpshooter, and then you have qualified. We call it pizza box. You'll see drone instructors do this. And if you do this, that means they're honing in on you and you're not going to like life for the next 72 hours. You passed, but you didn't pass good enough in their eyes. Um, with the drill instructors, nothing is ever good enough, no matter what. You could win final drill, you could win at the rifle range, because there's comp competitions, and they don't care. You are still equally worthless to the Marine Corps. Until you receive this, which is the Eagle Globe and Anchor, this is the one I received on my graduation boot camp day. Um, this is what recruits strive for. This is not given. You, you literally have to earn this. They do not give it to anybody. I also had to pay for it. Okay? <laughs> um, so boot camp was uh, initially a little weird, um, like I said, but uh, I got through it. You know, it, I knew it was going to be tough. I knew it was going to be hard. That's exactly what I expected. That's exactly what I wanted. If it was anything less, I would have quit and went and found something harder. That was just my mindset in life. Uh, going into SOI, I got stuck in what they call guard duty. That sucks. Uh, all you do is walk around and get made fun of by everybody else that have uh, been in the Marine Corps a lot longer. Um, and it's very cold at night. It's very hot during the day. Uh, and there are, I think it was a puma. Maybe it was a puma or a bobcat that would stalk most of us at night. Um, we walk all around uh, the School of Infantry training area which is just a small portion of Camp Pendleton. After that, I went into uh, School of Infantry, where it's a little different. You don't have to like, call yourself recruit anymore. You're actually a Marine at this time. And you use rank, which is very, very weird, especially after three months of calling your drill instructor sir. Now they want you to call your platoon leader sergeant. Well, sergeant and sir both start with an S, and when you're panicking because you're being yelled at, sometimes sir slips. And the next thing you know, you're running up a mountain. Um, that's not a joke. <laughs> that is actually true. Um, I have a couple pictures of uh, the weapons we utilized in, in SOI that I have here on my deployment uh, that you'll get to see. One is the M249 squad automatic weapon. It weighs 27 pounds unloaded. Carries a 200 round drum. So if you add that weight together, you're looking at about 30 pounds on top of 60 pounds of gear with boots uphill. It's not fun. So you make sure to be on your best behavior. Um, after that, you go to your parent unit. Your parent unit is the ones that prepare you for deployment. That's where the real training begins. You're going to get the guys that you're going to be serving with overseas. You're going to get assigned to your platoon, which will then be assigned to a squad, and then you'll be assigned to a fire team. So there's three fire teams in one squad. There's three squads in one platoon, and there's usually about five platoons in a company. Um, I'll go into that later, um, it's not really relevant to my case, but um, one of the things being the fleet is not something, we also call it the fleet, it's not something I actually expected. We got freedom on the weekends, which was very nice. Um, it really, I think about the time I got into the fleet was how I really realized how much freedom really meant something to people. When you have no freedom, in boot camp, they tell you which arm and leg to wash, 
They tell you when to wash your face. They tell you when to get dressed. They tell you when to eat. They tell you when to go to sleep. They tell you when to wake up. They tell you everything. You don't get a choice on anything. If you try to make a choice, they'll make a different choice for you and you'll do it. You don't have a choice. There's no escape. I've seen people try to run, climb out windows. I mean, I think people in, in, in Rikers Island have a better chance of escaping than you do from Marine Corps recruit training. When you're in, you're in, unless you quit. Um, so you get a really good understanding of how freedom really is and what it means to you. And so my initial thoughts going into the fleet were I gotta do my best because this is where my best is completely required. Um, and that was kind of my mindset. It kind of stayed the same through all three of those training operations. And in the fleet, you go through different courses, you get different training. Um, but as long as your mindset stays consistent with how you do things in the Marine Corps, um, you shouldn't have much of an issue, you know, unless it's a really bad mentality. And you're not going to make it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which war did you serve in? Well, now it's the America's longest war, so I kind of got that on Vietnam, guys. <laughs> I give them fun. I give them hell for that all the time. Um, I served in the Global War on Terrorism. Uh, I served in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, I was in Fallujah. And I served in Operation Enduring Freedom, where I was in Sangin, otherwise known as Bomb Valley. Um, and then I was also deployed on the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit um, in 2010, where we had one event occur. Uh, it was off the Horn of Africa, right out of the Strait of Hormuz. There was a fishing vessel called the Magellan Star in 2010 that was commandeered by Somali pirates. Um, we went in, we cleared out the Somali pirates, took them prisoner uh, as prisoners of war, criminals in international waters, um, without a shot being fired. Uh, happy day for a lot of people, sad day for some. Um, but nonetheless, nobody was injured, um, everyone came out okay, uh, and we were able to get the fishing vessel back up and running for the fishermen to continue on their way. Um, so those are the three deployments I, I, I did during the global war on terrorism that's been going on. Um, what were your service? Where exactly did you go? Ooh. Uh, well, I, I can tell you, I couldn't tell you all of them because I've got it written down on my isomat somewhere. Isomat, that thin piece of foam that you lay on that does nothing. Um, I've been to probably over 20 different countries. Uh, got to see many different cultures. Uh, war zone related, I've been to Kuwait three times. I've been to Iraq in 08 and 09, and I've been to Afghanistan in 2012. Um, like I said, in Iraq, I was in Fallujah. Um, it was kind of the end of the time in Iraq. It was winding down a lot. Um, Afghanistan was picking up when I was in Iraq, so for me, <laughs> I was being, I was trailing the, the war through the media. Um, but a lot of stuff hadn't changed. Uh, there was still people fighting and dying over there. Um, I was fortunate to get to see a historic event. I got to watch uh, Fallujah's first voting rights for both men and women. Um, I can tell you that ended badly. Um, it's a lot different over there, uh, and I wish I would have had more pictures, but uh, I was trying to find them, couldn't. But uh, Iraq is not a third world country, believe it or not. Um, a lot of people under the assumption it is. It's not a third world country. Um, it's got its shallow places, just like we do here in the U.S. You know, there are ghettos in the U.S., the projects, the, the place where, you know, people struggle a lot. Um, Fallujah was not like that. Fallujah was actually a city, a legitimate city. They had markets, they had cars. Saw one guy that had an undergo in a car. He actually had a better car than I did. Um, I thought that was amazing. Uh, Afghanistan, I was served in Sangin, otherwise known as Bomb Valley. Um, usually we would go on patrols and come across about four to six IEDs per patrol. Uh, we'd be out for about six to eight hours at a time in about 125 degree weather. Um, and that place is a third world country. Um, I saw one building there that was made out of concrete. The rest was made out of mud. Um, they have one light bulb and one generator. And you don't get to see them on very often because it, electricity there is in short supply. Very, very short supply. Um, we have, what is it now, iPhone what? Like 20? 13. Okay, iPhone 13. They still have flip phones. 
All right, they are they're very far behind the curve when it comes to technology. Afghanistan is definitely, and, 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 and quote me on this, they are definitely a third world country. Um, and there is a huge difference. The scenery in a third world country is a lot more beautiful in the aspect of nature wise. Um, however, they have a different way of doing things there. They do them in tribes. So tribe, there was, uh, I think it was 87 tribes in my sector alone. Half the city of Sangam was 87 tribes. Which means I had to deal with 87 tribal elders on a weekly basis. Um, in Fallujah, you had a mayor of the city. And I didn't have to deal with them, which was great. Um, but those were the three places I did uh, my tours of duty on. They call it a complete package. I was able to go to Iraq on ship and Afghanistan, um, which is exactly what I wanted. I'm going to be able to do all three of those. Um, and it was an eye-opening experience, to say the least. I hope that answered your question. Um, do you remember arriving and what was it like? Mm, arriving where? I guess like one of your com combat, like, uh, I don't know how to say it, like. Combat deployment? Sure, yeah. Maybe your first time deploying in. Oh. Mm. Well, the first thing I'll cover is I was scared. Um, anyone who says they're not scared, check their history. Um, because it's terrifying. You're going to a country where you don't speak their language at all. They don't speak yours at all. Um, and when you step into their border, we're, we're fighting a, a non-conventional enemy. Um, essentially what that means is they use no flag, no country flag. They have no uniforms. They dress exactly like the population and they weren't afraid to use women, children, and or young men or elderly men as a human shield just to get away. All right, they, uh, what they are, are terrorists. Um, that's what I went there to go fight. Um, my initial reaction was everyone is an enemy. Um, and it's scary because there, are, were, there were a lot of people in Fallujah, uh, equivalent to about the amount of the city of Newburgh. Um, and when you have the mindset of everyone's out trying to kill you, uh, it becomes extremely overwhelming. Um, so much so that your adrenaline shakes so much that you're, you're shaking in your hands. Um, but the Marine Corps taught you to suppress that. That's not needed right now to, to win the fight. Um, so thanks to my training, I was able to get my fear under control. Um, I was excited though at the same time because I got to see something new. I got to see a different culture. I got to see a way different people interacted with each other in a different country halfway across the planet. Um, I found it very interesting. I always say this. I traveled forward in time and I traveled back in time because the plane has a, does its arc over there. We left at 9 o'clock at night. I arrived at 9 o'clock in the morning <laughs> on a different day. <laughs> um, same thing going back. Uh, I, I left at about 11 a.m. going back home, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it was 11 p.m., but different day. So um, it was the day prior, which was hilarious, I thought. So I called myself a time traveler for a very long time. Um, but normally, I think, recalling on it now, I was 19 when I went into Iraq, um, young young man, you know, out in the world, didn't really get to explore a lot of the United States as a young adult, and here I am fighting in a war. I can assume you would probably <laughs> see some anxiety going on uh, when I walked in. However, the first hour after my uh, initial step through Iraq, we were hit by an IED, which that's when reality struck. Um, and I realized that there is a very, very highly likely chance I will not be walking back across the borders. Um, and that realization and that fear of death hit me hard. Um, but essentially when you sign up and during a time of war, the way I looked at it, it was a dead man walking. How long could I live before it was my end? Um, and that mentality carried me through most of Iraq. Um, and turning 20 in Iraq when I hit the double digits of the higher echelon there, I was out of my teen years. Um, Nothing really changed. You know, it was still the same mentality. A lot of people believe that deployments are hard. They are in an aspect of survival. 
but really, if you think about it, you don't have to worry about bills. You don't have to worry about filling your car with gas. You don't have to worry about groceries. You don't have to worry about taking care of your dog. All you got to do is worry about surviving the next day. That is it. So deployments do have a bit of an easy streak on them um, in that sense. And the, those positive outlooks that I had on it uh, is that what kept me through the, the seven and a half months I was over there. So it got better essentially as I went on each deployment. By the time I got in Afghanistan, the shakes had been gone. I knew what to expect. Uh, I knew what was probably going to end up happening and how to deal with it. Um, and so my anxiety, my fear didn't tend to last long. I still had the initial, I call it initial fear, fear of the unknown. I was in an area I had no idea, but I did tell myself that, hey, I'll get time to learn it. And once I learn it, I'll be more comfortable in my environment, just like any human being is. Um, and it only took a few short days, and I was out leading patrols on my own by that time. So. Uh, what was your job slash assignment? Um, in Iraq, my job was the squad's land navigation point man. Um, so I needed to know the entire map of the districts in which I operated in and the surrounding districts. Um, the district in Fallujah we operated in, we were smack dab in the middle of the city. Uh, is where my platoon was. And we were in uh, control of the Jolan, Kadari, and um, Andros, uh, the, uh, it starts with an A, I, I really can't pronounce it. Um, we called it the pizza slice, because that's where the market was. And it looks like a pizza slice on the map. It's the only way I could remember it, but my job was making sure that the routes that we were taking on patrol didn't overlap from the last route. Uh, we had an escape plan, a secondary, um, and then we had a backup plan. We also had uh, the, uh, what, we, what we would call QRF, reinforcement points. So an area to where if we took contact, otherwise known as kill zones, um, QRF could easily get to us and I could tell them which route to take or my squad leader, call my squad leader and tell them which route to take uh, to get to us. And, and if it wasn't for that kind of planning and preparation that my training taught me, I'm pretty sure we, me and, and the five other guys I served with in my squad would probably be dead. Um, so that was my job in Iraq, was the, the lead navigation point man for uh, my squad, and I was also the second gun truck turret gunner uh, behind the 240. I've got a picture of that um, that I can show you all later. Um, in my second deployment on ship, I was the assistant patrol leader, so right below squad leader. Uh, my job was ensuring that all team leaders uh, in our squad understood uh, the training regiment that was handed forth from our squad leader, and I was to enforce it. Uh, enforcing things in the Marine Corps is a lot different than enforcing things here in school. If they don't do it, you yell and berate them. You can't really do that here in school, so if any of you plan on joining the military, be prepared to be yelled at, because that is a very common thing. Uh, doesn't mean they hate you, it just means they need to get some stress off their chest, that's all. Um, and so I conducted a lot of training with the team leaders and then had the team leaders conduct that same exact training with their fire teams. I also had a fire team of my own, uh, being the first uh, fire team leader. I had to train them just as well. Um, so I had kind of a dual job going on. Uh, in Afghanistan, I was a patrol base commander. So I, I was in charge of my own patrol base, over $25 million worth uh, of equipment. Um, and I had a total of 45 guys in my base that I was in charge of on top of uh, 87 tribal elder meetings once a week, <coughs> usually on Thursdays, because market Fridays, no one was around. Uh, and I was in charge of training them, as well as the Afghan National Police. Um, have you ever, ever tried to train anybody on something that doesn't speak English? I implore you, try it. It is a great challenge, a very great challenge. They also tried to teach me something as well. Unfortunately, it's also a great challenge to try to understand and learn some of the things they teach when they don't speak English. Um, so we had an interpreter, and the interpreters were a, a huge, huge success um, towards our overall mission, which was getting the Afghan people up and ready to defend themselves in the moment we leave. So those were my three jobs. Um, did you see combat? I did. Um, so, in Iraq, uh, I, so any, what's defined by combat is uh, engagement with the enemy through any violent means. So, IEDs are one, 
Um, I know people that have uh, what we call the uh, CAR, um, Combat Action Ribbon, um, which is this one right here, one right below the Purple Heart. And uh, in the Army, I think they call it the Combat Badge. I, I'm not entirely sure. I just like making fun of the Army. I don't really know much about them. It's kind of like a brother thing. Um, however, uh, I've known some people that have that that have only just seen an IED go off, been in the proximity. Um, as for firefights, yes, I've been in quite a few. Um, were they scary? Hell yes. They, are, they were terrifying. You never know where the bullets are coming from, regardless of what you all believe. And I'm going to say this, and I say this now, and I say this to every single video game player, because I'm a video game player, I video games, I love it. I don't play Call of Duty. The reason is, Call of Duty is not real. It, it does not depict anything of what war is like in any way, shape, or form. Um, the reason is, is there, there is very rare circumstances into which you'll ever come face to face with your enemy. Most of it will be door to door, which has happened to me before, and it is very, very terrifying. Um, it's whoever's quicker on the trigger, and you better hope your gun doesn't jam. All right. Uh, most of the firefights, you're getting shot at from a place you have no idea where it's coming from. Zero. You're looking for muzzle flashes. You're actually having to, me being the younger guy in Iraq, I had to actually step outside the road, and then when they'd shoot, I'd go back inside so that way they could see where the muzzle flash was at. That's how you identify where they're at, and it's very important. Um, it's also, you know, if you have a casualty, it's nothing like running over and just like hitting them with a heavy pin for like 30 seconds or whatever it takes. Not like that. As a matter of fact, you actually have to let your friend sit there and bleed because the most important thing you can do for him is rounds down range. If you go out there and try to get him and you get hit, now there's two problems your squad leader's got to worry about and you're probably going to get the beating. All right, so you, you, it's very, 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 very different um, when you sprint, you know, and, and then you try to look down the scope of your weapon or the iron sights. It's not, it's not stable. You're, it bounces. Not only that, you're shaking from all the adrenaline. And it's very, 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 very easy to miss your target. Um, I've seen someone dump an entire 30-round magazine. Into one guy and into one guy's area, and not even hit him once, not even come close. Um, and that's because we had to trudge about a half a mile um, in full combat load all the way back. And uh, so, if you, any of you are playing Call of Duty and you get that notion like, "Oh, I should do the military," I'm gonna tell you right now, it is not anything like that. nothing about that is remotely close to what you'll ever experience. So. Um, I did see combat in Afghanistan. Uh, one of the pictures I believe that um, are on the thing, it's the uh, one, it's me and another Marine, we're in dress blues. I'll bring this one up. Okay, I'll, I'll tell the story really quick here. Um, so where I finally got my Purple Heart um, was in Afghanistan. Uh, 